morning. God's scriptures today is in Romans 3, 21 through 26. <clears throat> righteousness through faith. But now our righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand un unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So be it. What a blessed people we are that we can have redemption of our sins just through faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are a perfect God, that you lovingly sent your Son to die for our sins, and that by faith we can be restored, not by our works of righteousness, but by faith in Jesus Christ alone, because he is the one that we should pattern our lives after. He is the one that gave up heaven to give his life to save us. We thank you, God, for being so faithful, so kind to us. And Lord, may we realize who we are in Christ the obligation and the mission that we have set before us to be a light to this world. May we become less so that Jesus can be more. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you notice the palm leaves coming in, this is Palm Sunday. I assume I can thank Rona for that. I guess. Is that right, Kim? I don't know. It wasn't me. And Steve? <laughs> Palm Sunday. Now let me remind you a little bit of what that is because we get some misconceptions here and there and everything. But Palm Sunday, Jesus comes in, fulfills Scripture, deliberate fulfilling of Scripture here. Jesus gets the donkey and everything. But there's some things in there that if you read the Scripture that He could not have deliberately done. He told His disciples, you know, when you come into town, find the cult and everything. And he says, if anybody asks, tell them what I'm doing. And they ask. And in one of the accounts, it says, we'll see a guy carrying water. Wait a minute. You know, he could have planned the donkey tied up somewhere and everything, but how would he know that they would have made a guy carrying water? God is sovereign. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem, lowly riding on a donkey. The crowd realizes he just come off of healing Lazarus, raising him from the dead. And he comes into town riding on the donkey, and what do they think? They think that Jesus is going to come in and throw, overthrow the Roman Empire at that time. Save them from their persecution. But see, God had something so much bigger in plan. It would be that His Son would die on a cross to save you from your sins for all eternity. Not to save you from oppression that you're facing today, but to save you for all eternity, for the penalty of sin that you've committed against a righteous, holy God. They had no idea that later that week their Messiah, their Savior, would be dying on a cross. <laughs> and then all their hopes were lost because they had no idea again that He would raise from the dead. We know these things. They are a fact. And they should forever change your life so that you're thankful for the new life that you have in Christ and so that you live a life that brings glory and honor to God. I entitled this message, Shepherding the Sheep. Because if you're reading along in Samuel, you'll notice this little shepherd boy that beats Goliath up. We just read about that. You'll notice some other things. You'll also notice, like I said, that Jesus called himself a shepherd. He shepherded his sheep and then died for his sheep. 
I never dreamed of being a pastor. I know I was just changing topics. Like, where did that go? But I am. Because that's what God has called me to do. I don't know what God is calling you to do, but He is calling you to be a light. It may not be to pastor a church. It may to be that light out in the world to tell others about Jesus Christ. You know, it's not my job. Well, it's not your job to save people either. It's the Holy Spirit's. But it's your job to go out and tell them and be a witness in the place that you're at. My job is to shepherd you. That's what the word pastor means. It means to shepherd, to feed the flock, to care for it, to protect it, to nurture it. I care for sheep. You're out there in the world with goats and you have an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus Christ and hopefully that light will shine. The words that you say will draw them so that they can come into the fold. That's not my job. <laughs> yes, it is when I'm out there because I am another one of you, another light out there. But it is each and every one of our jobs to be a light out in the world to tell others of Jesus Christ. The love that God has for us that He would send His Son to die for us. If you Google the word pastor, you'll come up with a Wikipedia definition that says this, the word pastor derives from the Latin noun pastor. Oh, that's real intellectual, isn't it? Which means shepherd and is derived from the, the verb pascare, which means to lead to pasture, set to graze, cause to eat. So I have a question. Are you eating? And you know I'm going to get to it in a little bit. You know I'm going to ask you if you're reading along and eating and if you're up to Samuel 24 today. Because I'm going to keep asking you that because I'm going to keep trying to spur you on to good works. Because every one of you should be reading your Bible every day. Jesus says that man may, cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you should be reading your Bible anyway. So even more you should be writing, reading it along with your fellow brothers and sisters so that you can spur them along. So when you come to meet them, you can say, Hey, what about that that you read this week in 1 Samuel chapter 9? So that we can do that for one another, so that we can be training up our children and talking to them when we get up and when we go to bed and so forth. The reason that I never wanted to be a pastor is because I was friends with many pastors. And I watched sheep, instead of grazing on the Word of God, instead of loving and being led to pasture, I watched them gnaw on the shepherds. <laughs> and I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to get gnawed on by a bunch of sheep. I have to say that God has put me in a church where I don't get gnawed on very often. That is wonderful. But they're still gnawing. We're, you're, we're human beings. We sin, period. We still offend one another. But we can go to one another, ask for forgiveness, get back on track, lay down ourselves so that we can uplift Christ. But that's the reason. I didn't want to ever be that person. I'd, I told the Lord I'd be an evangelist, I'd, I'd be a missionary, whatever, but I never wanted to pastor a church. Well, I'm so glad he's got bigger plans because I could never ask for anything any, any better than that calling. And I spend a lot of time so that I can be up here and shepherd you and lead you through God's Word. And I try my best to spur you and be an example and everything else. But guess what? You can take a horse to water, but you can't what? Make him drink. Make him drink. I can get up here and spur you on and spur you on and spur you on. But it's up to you whether you read and study God's Word and you meditate and you pre preach and teach it to your children and if you're a light to the world or not. That's what we're called to be. I could stop right here and that would be the message and, and it's great. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. That's why Jesus came and died and why He taught, gave us the Great Commission to go and teach and preach and train up disciples. This is where the training takes place. We've got a lot of chances to do that. You've got Sunday night Bible study where we go verse by verse. You've got a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study. You've got movie night. You've got men's prayer breakfast. You've got Awanas. There's plenty of times that you can come in and nourish and grow and spend time with one another. And we know that the Bible says that we should meet together, not get out of the habit of meeting as some people do. That this is the place that we come and get fed, prepared, uplifted, bring our burdens, bring our, our everything laid down so that we're opened with one another so that the gifts of the Spirit can lift us up. The Spirit gives different gifts accordingly. 
as he sees fit to build up or edify the church so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in the world. So as we're approaching Easter and thinking about Jesus Christ, God's only Son, coming and laying down His life, are you laying down your life in return? Are you doing what God has called you to do where He's called you to do it? If not, if you're not willing to be fed, why are you here? It's a legitimate question. A lot of people play church today to mark off a box. Or they feel like they're going to get saved through osmosis. That just being around Christians or around the Word of God will save them. Well, I guarantee you, I'm never going to get into this Bible doing this. Not going to, not going to penetrate me. I've got to read and study it. I've got to take and devour it and see what God is saying to me and apply it to my life or it's not going to do me much good. And yeah, I might have to start out with, with milk and then, and then get to a little, something a little easier to digest and then get into the harder topics. And you know what? It's great to talk about the harder topics, but do we lose the focus on some of them sometimes and look at them instead of pursuing mercy and grace? I believe... Jesus told that to the Pharisees. He said, you've got the letter of the law down, but you failed to realize the application in the mercy and the grace. And that's what Jesus Christ was doing when He came into Jerusalem, was He was coming to lay down His life, not to overthrow the Roman Empire, not to bring an end to suffering. He said, if you want to be My disciple, take up your cross. Instrument of suffering and death, just like Jesus did. He said, no greater love that a man has but to lay down his life for his friend. And he also said, if you don't take up your cross and come after me, then you're not worthy of me. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author writes this, starting in verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess." If we profess we know Jesus Christ, then we shouldn't care about what's going on, if there's Roman persecution in this world or not. We should care about being a like Christ, an example to the world. Let us hold unswervingly to that hope that we have, because this life is meaningless. What matters is what we're going to have for all eternity. For he who promised is faithful, verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We come in here to get our tanks filled so we can go out there and love the world and do good deeds. So we can love even our enemies. When they slap us on the cheek, we can turn the other cheek and say, here's this one also. When they say, I want your jacket, we can give them our shirt also. That's what we do when we come here and love one another so that we can be prepared to go out in the world and be different, to be set apart, a holy, sanctified people. Think about what you've read so far, that, that the nation of Israel was supposed to be totally set apart so that the rest of the world could see that the God of Israel was the one true God. Maybe they would come and turn to that God, maybe they wouldn't. But we're supposed to be that light to the world. Not giving up meeting together, verse 25, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, <laughs> which is getting closer and closer. Verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? I don't know if you got all that and caught all that in, but I don't want to be that guy. You can take that however it affects you, how it speaks to you. I don't want to be the person who takes their salvation lightly. Maybe there's not salvation at all. Maybe there's not, won't be that well done, my good and faithful servant. You take it however you want to say it, but the author here is saying, don't you dare take lightly what Jesus Christ died for. Verse 30, For we know, know Him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. 
And again I say this, the Lord will judge his people. Not, he didn't say someone else here, it's his people, those who profess his name. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As I said earlier, I try to spur you on to good works. I can't do anything. I tried to train up my son, and it got to the point of I thought I could beat it into him. Remember those days? And all that did was drive him further away. So I had to say, you know what? God, I need to love him. There's a verse somewhere that says something about love covers a multitude of sins, <laughs> covers mine, covers his, so that we can love each other and know that the only way that we can love each other and forgive each other like that is because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Then I can think of these other words like children are a blessing and heritage to the Lord, and so forth. So I can realize what God has given me Appreciate it and be thankful, rejoicing all the time. I said it last week, I think the week before, Joshua made that plea. He said, decide what is desirable for you today. You always hear the other part. Decide this day whom you will serve, but it's for me and my house. We will follow the Lord. We will serve the Lord. But don't miss that part, what's desirable because if it's not desirable for you, if you don't consider this life rubbish or garbage, as Paul says, compared to your future rewards in heaven, you will never find it desirable to serve the Lord. You will always come up with an excuse. There's not enough time in the day. I'm tired. I just really don't want to be ridiculed by this person. I don't know what it's going to cost me. I plan on going off today and going fishing. I, I didn't plan on stopping and, and meeting my neighbor at the end of the road that needs to know about Jesus Christ today. That's not what I had in my mind today. Well, read Scripture. <laughs> I think you'll see all the time when, when God speaks, you're supposed to listen, and He's putting those things to test your faith, to see if you will be obedient or not. What is desirable for you? Is it desirable for you to read the Word of God each day? Is it desirable for you to read along with your fellow brothers and sisters? That's up to you. You have to decide whether it's desirable or not. Every Christian should be feeding just as much as you eat food, which we all love to do. You should be feeding on God's Word, chewing it up, digesting it so that you can be nourished and grow to maturity. Today you should be up in your Bible reading to 1 Samuel chapter 21 to 24, but I want to go back and read a little bit of what you should have read this week. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verses 1 through 20. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba, but his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and said to Samuel at Ramah, they said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us. What if Samuel would have made his sons, which he can't make them, but he can train them up, to follow the Lord? What if he would have disciplined them? What if they would have followed the Lord because they decided it was desirable that day? Then Israel wouldn't need a king to lead them, would they? They had a king. He was the God of all the nations, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. If you read on, you'll, you'll find it's, he, that God told Samuel to go ahead and do what the people told him to do, that they had rejected him as king, that they hadn't rejected Samuel. Okay? They said to him, You are old and your sons and daughters do not follow our ways. Now appoint a king to lead us. Such as all the other nations have. There we go. We don't want to be set apart and holy. We want to be like everybody else. We look at them and see that they're flourishing in everything and we're being persecuted. Rome is persecuting us, so we want our Savior to come in and take this heathen nation out from oppressing us. But God had something so much bigger in plan. Your sacrifice for every sin you've ever committed, ever will commit, every one period would be laid upon that cross on Friday. Jesus Christ would shed His blood to save you. 
God has so much bigger plans than you can ever see. Verse 6, But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all the, what the people are saying. It is not... Not, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as king. As they have got, done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king, that the, what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will do this. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to the commanders of thousands and commanders of fifty, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still to others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakes, bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your, and your vintage and give it to officials and attendants, your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and the donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and your cells become his slaves. I don't know about you, but I don't want a king. <laughs> that would make me right there say, I don't want one. But they see the rest of the world and think, hey, what am I missing out on? This following Jesus is going to cost me in this world. Yeah, it is. It should. It cost Jesus Christ his life. It cost him heaven. He did that so you could have eternal life where there is no death, there is no sorrow, there is no suffering, there is no shame. Why would I not want to give up this life in exchange for that? You got a quarter? Change it for a million bucks. Sounds like a good deal, right? That can't even compare to what this life is so meaningless compared to our life in eternity. Verse 18, though, When that day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us then we will be like all the other nations. I think we heard that a little bit earlier, didn't we? With a king to lead us and a king to go before us and a king to fight our battles when they had the greatest king they ever could have. If only the children of God would have decided what was truly desirable for them that day. If Samuel would have invoked that on his children. And if you keep reading, you'll see what happened with Saul and you see, see what's going to happen with David. We haven't quite got there yet. And be sure you watch the videos. There's two videos on Samuel. Um, there's the one on first and then there's one on the second. They're about eight minutes apiece. If I had time to do that, you wouldn't get the joy of hearing me preach. <laughs> but I gave you the little uh, diagrams and everything. They're very helpful. So remember that. We went from them not driving out the pagans in their land and, and intermarrying and following after their gods, the judges, and we've seen the failures there, and now we're going to see the kings. Even David, a man after God's own heart, we're going to see the terrible atrocities he committed. But the difference in David is he repented. And he said, against you, Lord, have I sinned. So tying this together, today is Palm Sunday. Jesus makes his triumphal entry in as a humble shepherd who would be king but not in the way they thought and they cried out Hosanna save us save us but then on Friday he was being crucified and they thought all hope was lost bigger picture here so let's go to the New Testament and look at Luke chapter 19 and look about Palm Sunday in Luke 19, verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. Biggest of sinners. Okay? He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to know for himself if this was truly the Messiah or not. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately I must stay at your house today so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly all the people saw this and began to mutter he was go 
He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. That's why Jesus came, to save you from your sins. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody about anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus wanted to know who Jesus was. Jesus responded, and Zacchaeus got out of that tree. What if he said, No, nah, not today. I got other things today. I can see better from up here. This sounds reasonable and desire to me to be up here. Because I get down, I'm short, and I can't, I can't see you then. And the people, they'll, they'll want to do away with me because I'm the worst of sinners. No, he got down. He followed what Jesus said. And then he said, If it's going to cost me, so what? If it costs me, I'll give restitution. Because what matters is what you offer, Jesus, is so much greater than anything that I can have in this world today. And Jesus says that salvation has come today to that household because He has the faith of Abraham. Verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. That's His purpose. While they were listening to this, He went on to tell them a parable because He was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. We want instant gratification. We see that in this world today, don't we? Instant gratification. If I'm saved, then I want all the privileges of that. Give me the prosperity gospel. I like that one. That if I do anything right, that God will bless me. Maybe He will, maybe He won't. He's God. He can do whatever He wants to. He's a king. A king can say whatever dictates and mandates he wants to set, and you have to follow them. Praise be to God that we have a good king. And he is faithful and true. So he tells them this parable. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten, ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent delegate, delegation after him to say, We want this man instead to be our king. Ugh, sounds a lot like we just read, didn't it? See, I'm tying it together. Okay. He, he was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to, to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. What they had gained. The Spirit gives you gifts so that you can use them to build up the body of Christ and draw others to salvation. Not so you can say, I got gifts, look at me. Or any other reason. He gives them to, for you to use them. <clears throat> Verse 16. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant. Don't you want to hear that? Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter with this life that you've been given to live on earth. Take charge of ten cities. Ten cities in comparison. Some coins versus cities. Hmm. The second came and said, said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a special cloth. I kept it. It's safe for you, but you didn't do anything with it. Verse 21, I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant instead of, well done, my good servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I have co could have at least collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Now I'm not going to get deep into this today, but why did the guy with ten get more? Because he was faithful, so was the guy with five. But the guy with ten was given more to be faithful with. Okay? Every one of you, yep, I'm pointing fingers, has so much to be grateful for. You live in a country where you are free to proclaim the Word of God. You're not persecuted for it. Oh, you might get laughed at, you might lose your job, but you're not persecuted by your life and your family's life being threatened. 
You can go out there. You can come to church freely, get equipped, and go out in the world and tell others of Jesus Christ. You can raise up your children for sure that way and not be persecuted. You have been given ten minas. Every last one of us. And we will be held accountable. He replied, I tell you, verse... building for his kingdom rather than our own I think Jesus gave us a prayer like that right your kingdom come thy will be done not mine my life is meaningless compared to what Jesus Christ has done to save me so I started today talking about shepherds instead of kings and how God has called me to shepherd this church I try to do that. Like I said, I try to spur you on, but I can't make you do it. I can get up here and plead my case every Sunday. But I can't make you do it. That's a decision that you have to make yourself. I have decided what I'm going to do. I will serve the Lord. I hope you will do the same. Sometimes sheep don't see eye to eye with the shepherd either. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to see eye to eye on everything that I teach or anything else. But you do need to respect my position because God has called me to be this shepherd. So when I do preach God's Word, if it offends you, it's not me that offended you. It's you were offended by what you heard. And I'm going to be bold enough to proclaim it because I have to be answer to God again. And your blood is on my hands when I took this call. And I don't take it lightly. And I do study so that I don't get up here and speak something that is heresy. And so that I do try to motivate you. And so that I can be like Paul and hopefully you can imitate me. Am I a sinner? Do I do wrong? Every day. Where's Sherry? Just ask her. <laughs> She'll tell you for sure. But it doesn't mean that I don't love you and want to lead you with everything that I can. The thing is, if you don't realize you are a sheep, you won't want to be led by a shepherd. If you don't want to be led by me, then are you going to want to be led by Jesus Christ? Or are you going to want another king? See how it all rolls together? I'm so thankful for the privilege and opportunity that I have to get up here and preach and teach. Last Sunday night, I taught a little bit about, and sometimes I'll do this, I'm going to do this today. <laughs> I taught about something that most people hadn't thought about, and it wasn't to get rocks thrown at me, but I felt like I was getting rocks thrown at me somewhat. <laughs> I 
I said, how long did it take Noah to build his ark? Anybody? Well, we're typically taught 100 years or 120 years. And the Bible doesn't say, period. It does not say. So be careful sometimes when you think you hear these words over and over again. So I'm getting to a point here. And you say, well, I've heard that. It don't really apply to me. And you kind of tune out. Every word that got from God's mouth, every time you read this, every time you listen to a sermon, every time you talk about it with one another, look what you can pull out of that scripture. Taste it. You have taste buds. When you eat food, you taste that food. You don't just gobble it down. You're like, oh, this is good or this is bad. Discern it. Apply it to your life. Don't just say, oh, I just know that story and I'm, I'm tuning it out. So I'll tell you a little bit about David and Goliath today. See if you, if you read that story. You just read it, right? Right? You should have read it. You should have read it. Okay. Let's read it. 1 Samuel 17. You got it up on the board? Because I don't see Bibles in hands. Okay. Verse 32 is where we're starting at. And basically the Philistines and Israel at war. The Philistines have a giant hero named Goliath. The two armies have faced off on, on two sides of the battle. And for 40 days Goliath has taunted them saying, Send out your best hero to fight me. If one of you will fight me, then we will become your servants. That, you really think that's going to happen first of all? Think about that in the story. The rest of the Philistine army is just going to bow down to the Israelites even if they defeat the Goliath? No. But if they defeat Goliath, they're going to panic. And there's, then the Israelites have that advantage of the panic. The other way around will be the other way around. Okay? But starting in verse 32, little David shepherd boy comes in. And in your Bible stories, you're always taught he's a little bitty boy. Okay? He's a young man. Okay? And he's, he's probably as fit as any. He, we find that he's killed a lion and a bear. Okay? All right? So don't just see your Bible stories and see this little bitty boy. Let me ask you a question. Why did David not wear Saul's armor? Nope. Okay, there's one question. Second question. What did David fight Goliath with? What? Is that all? Okay, let's read a story. Okay? Let's pray first to open our minds up to the Scripture. Okay? Father in heaven, Lord, may your words come alive to us. May we hear your words and apply them to our lives. May we not sit in church day after day and think we know so much about you, but that you want to teach us every single day with every single word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. When I was reading this story, I've read it plenty of times too. I was like, oh, I didn't notice that. I didn't notice that. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. I'm using the NIV. We can use whatever version we want. And he has been a warrior from his youth. Well, he doesn't know about David's warrior background because David's going to justify himself in just a second. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. I'm a shepherd. But when a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and struck it. I am a warrior, just not the kind of warrior you're thinking about. And I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned to seize me, so he not only rescued the sheep, that means he saved the life of the sheep, when the beast turned on him, the lion or the bear, he seized it by its hair, we'll take that as mane or, or whatever, struck it and killed it. Now my first question to you is what did he strike it with? You don't have to answer it, let's just read on. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. I got faith and since this Philistine has no respect for God. God will fight this battle for me. And I've already proven myself anyway. I am a young man capable. I killed a lion and a bear. And I'm glad the kids are in for this part. Okay? I've done all that. Okay? The Lord who rescued me, verse 37, from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. <clears throat> Saul said to, said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed him in his own tunic. 
He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. The Bible stories do teach us <laughs> that it, the armor was too big for David. Does it say that here? If you read and study God's word, he's going to say that, he, that the armor was not proved by him. Here's what the NIV goes on to say. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. I'm not comfortable with them. But there's more to it. If you study the word, they're not proven in battle to me. They might be proven in battle to you, but they're not proven in battle to me. I want to go fight Goliath with what is familiar for me to fight him with. The same things that I have killed the lion and the bear with. Which remember he said that he struck them. Twice he says he struck them. So he needs something to strike them with. Okay? So he took them off. Verse 40. Then he took his what? Staff. Maybe that's what he struck them with. Hmm. We think of a shepherd's staff as just something to walk around with. The word used is going to be the same word that Goliath says in a minute when he says, do you come at me with sticks? It means a rod, a staff, a stave, is what the King James Version said. The word is makale. It means any kind of rod. It was the diviner's rod that Balaam used. Okay, It could be something that was used to attack the lion and the bear and kill them with. Okay. But he took his staff in his hand. This is one hand. He chose five stones from the stream, I'm assuming with the other hand, because he carried them. And notice he goes into battle as a shepherd, not a warrior. Right? Which will confuse Goliath. Okay? He chose five stones from the stream, put them into his pouch in his shepherd bag, with his sling in his hand. Okay? Now he's got his sling in his hand and his shepherd's staff in his hand. He approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, came, kept coming closer to David. He took David over and saw that he was little more than a boy. Okay, we get boy there in comparison. In the Philistine's eye, he was. He's a giant. He's 10 feet tall. He was glowing with health. That means he was in good physical shape and handsome even more. Most big giants aren't that handsome. I don't picture him that way, but maybe he was. I don't know. And he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Same word as the previous word for staff. Goliath, this big giant, saw David coming at him with a staff. He didn't see the sling. Maybe that was a military tactic. Maybe not. Maybe he wanted him to focus on the staff so he could then take the sling and hit him. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I know that he had two weapons in his hand, not one. A staff and a sling. He came as a shepherd against a mighty warrior. Picture this now, and you see it a little differently maybe than you have. And if you take the thing in my dog that you come at me with sticks, he doesn't mean as a dog and you take a stick and fetch it. <laughs> he means, again, how you would discipline a dog and hit a dog. Because if you take dog from Scripture, dogs were less than. When you compare me to a dog, you're saying that you don't respect me at all. David, Goliath is saying, David, you don't respect me. You send a boy out here to fight your battles, and he comes to me with a shepherd's staff? I'm going to chew him up. So let's see what he says. He says, And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. What is he going to cut his head off with? He don't have a sword. Okay, that's fine. This very day I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's Jesus called himself a shepherd. Hmm. And a shepherd's shepherd staff is what David goes out to meet Goliath with. And he will give all of you into our hands. 
As the Philistine moved closer to attack, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. He reached into his bag, taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. Now, like I said before, maybe that was a tactic so that you're focusing on this so I can take this. You see, if you learn a little bit about slingers and you read more in the Bible, they were part of the army. They were right before the bow and arrows. So you had your heavy infantry, but you had these guys back slinging rocks, and then you had bow and arrows. Well, if you didn't have bow and arrows and stuff because you didn't have much armor, you didn't have swords, if you remember reading, only Saul and Jonathan even had a sword a few chapters ago. I don't know how many they have now, but they were the only two that even had swords prior to that. There's also some shepherds use a combination of a sling made onto the staff, so they can go like that with a staff. Don't know, I wasn't there. But I do know that he had a staff and a sling, and even Goliath said, why are you coming at me with your staff? It's what he saw. He said, I don't know if it was a battle tactic, I don't know what it was, but when we tell the story, we missed the shepherd's staff in it. He came at him as a shepherd, humble and lowly, but yet he became the king of Israel. Jesus came into Jerusalem lowly and humbly, but he's the king of all kings and lord of all lords. And he became king of all kings and lord of all lords. He was, but became again, because Scripture says he was lifted up and elevated because he gave up his life to save yours. Do you see the connections there? The stone sank, he slung, he reached in his stone, into his bag, taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And a shepherd's staff. Because we know that before. Did you hear me? And a shepherd's staff. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. I think you've read this far already, or you'll read it today. I'm not sure. But when David runs from Saul, he gets Goliath's sword from the priest. But he doesn't use it. Instead of killing Saul again, killing his enemies, he just cuts off a piece of his garment and says, I could have killed you, but instead I loved you. And what does love do? It covers a multitude of sins. And Saul said... You're right. Do you see the difference in coming lowly and humbly and serving your king versus trying to do it your own way? Fighting with a shepherd's staff. You might have the other things too. Jesus told his disciples to pick up swords and carry swords. And they told him, we have two. Two among twelve. I would want to be one of the two that had a sword, wouldn't you? I wouldn't want it to be six down from me. But they, when he sent out the seventy, he told them to take their staffs with them. Hmm to be like the king, to humble yourself, to give up your life, to take up your cross so that you can save others. Isn't that what Easter's about? And I hope you learn something from that story. And you know, I'd agree with me on everything about it, but are you willing to hear and learn and be taught so that you can feed and grow and mature to be more like Christ? Good Friday, you have a chance to invite people to this movie. Good, good opportunity to invite your neighbors and friends. It's an enjoyable movie regardless. You saw some humor in it and stuff. It's well done. But you saw him on the end saying when he got up there on that cross and they spattered that paint on him because he didn't have the blood on him like that, that he said, I get it. I get it. I'm yours. Because he realized what Jesus Christ did for him. Come Easter morning for sunrise service if you can too. Remember it's 6 a.m. And I'll close this in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you that your words are alive, that they're living and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Lord, may we hunger and thirst for righteousness. May we train up our children to hunger and thirst for righteousness. May they follow in the steps of the shepherd king, not David, but the one who David was telling that would come, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, that at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We thank you for Jesus humbly coming to this earth and laying down his life to save us. To God be the glory and praise and honor to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have four things, I think.